Hey, Angie Bird here, and this is Midlife Magic and Mayhem. Okay, y'all, get ready. This one is fire. On January 16th, 2023, I made a request. The day before, I saw an Instagram post, a quote-unquote word anthem, describing the now very famous photograph of Jamie Lee Curtis unabashedly celebrating Michelle Yeoh's win for Best Actress at the Golden Globes on January 10th, 2023. Erin Gallagher wrote a post on LinkedIn about the image of the two famous actresses in that moment, and I'm linking to go read that post here in the show notes. It starts, ladies, this is your vibe for 2023, unabashed hype woman, full on, full out, full force. That post from Aaron Gallagher went everywhere. It became the very definition of viral. A friend of Jamie Lee's sent it to her, where Jamie Lee Curtis herself reposted it and coined the term word anthem. The hashtag hype women is now being used all over social media as a flag or more like a torch to gather women in solidarity to the flame of lifting each other, to overcome and disavow any disempowering systems that keep women feeling in competition with each other instead of holding each other in support and accountability. Erin Gallagher is the founder and CEO of Ella, an inclusive network unlocking women's access to human and financial capital. Ella recognizes women's value and increases their valuation. The ethos, change is inevitable, growth is optional, true metamorphosis requires both. Ella provides connection, coaching, and consulting to support your transformation. Erin brings almost 20 years experience leading global marketing, business development, media relations, branding, communications, and organizational and culture change to the many roles she currently plays, small business owner, disruptor, entrepreneur, system challenger, and mother to two young boys. She has counseled C-suite and senior leaders at some of the world's biggest and best brands and companies, from LinkedIn to United Airlines to Carhartt to McDonald's, and forged relationships with change makers and leaders who believe in the power of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Early that morning of January 16th, 2023, in the midst of what I can only imagine was a true boatload of incoming media requests, she has been contacted by major media outlets, I sent her a message asking her to be on my brand new baby podcast, and she said yes, with enthusiasm. This woman walks her talk. She is out to be a disruptor, a change maker, and she supported a complete stranger with a bit of her time to share with us her vision of a future where women have the human and financial resources to create a world that works for all of us, for us, by us. My hand is added to that torch. This podcast is my way of gathering all our flames so we can see a new way from our deep wellness wildness, and wisdom, because that's what's needed now. Please enjoy this very inspiring conversation with me and Erin Gallagher. Hello, Erin Gallagher. Thank you for being here. Hello, Angie Bird. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited for the conversation we're going to have today. Me too. And I have to be super transparent and honest about something. I was trying to meditate earlier and I literally couldn't like, Mm. couldn't like there was just so much, I was like, "Ah, so much, like I'm just going to have to sit here and chill and just relax for a second. Just, you know, know, because I was so excited and thrilled about, about talking to you. Absolutely. And what I think is interesting about meditating as a person that does not do it, um, needs to do it and <laughs> hasn't figured out how to is that I think without it being the intention, it can sometimes be an exercise in like execution versus just a acceptance and space of for grace. Mm-hmm. And so when I try to do it and my wife, my mind wanders and I'm not doing the thing I'm supposed to be doing and I go to reach for my phone and then I'm not supposed to do that, then I fail, right? And so like, it becomes this exercise in self-worth and like, in my ability to do it. And I think 
it meditation looks different for all of us. And so if yours was to just be a little more frenetic that time, and mine might sometimes be to do active meditation, which is I'm going to do something that's an exercise with like for my hands, I'm going to color code the kids Legos, even though there is no point in doing that, but it's going to force me to focus on something. Then that's what we do. A hundred percent. And I also think that, um, as much as I love kind of a more structured ish meditation practice for what it's good for, I agree with you completely. Like a lot of the time I'll just ask myself, okay, what is it that I really, what do, what do I need right now? What is this thing calling for? What would be most supportive for this? It might be movement. It might be a walk. It might be color coding Legos, which I used to do back in the day a lot for no reason. <laughs> Yep. Just because it was pleasing to me and relaxing. Um, so totally get that. But anyway, not to like start off on a, on a tangent, but it is, I love that. Like, it's a great um, message that we don't always have to be in the structure of what's set up for us as it being the right way to do it. Oh girl, if that isn't, if that <laughs> right? is not the tangent, but the actual core of what we're here to talk uh -huh. about, I don't know what is. So it's perfect. That was, that was beautifully said. It's perfect. It's perfect. So People have heard the introduction at this point, but I would love to hear from you. Who is Aaron? Give us a give us a bit of your backstory, and then I would love to hear what the past week and a half has been like <laughs> for you in your life. Woo! Yes. Um, so my backstory. I I grew up in um, a military family. My mom was in the Coast Guard, so we moved every two to four years my entire life. And so that meant all the way up until college, I was, as I was just sort of getting settled, we were on the move again. And that, what, what that had forced, what that forced me to do and what became, I think, a superpower is I have to be a good connector. I have to be a good communicator. And it's important to know who I am so that I can actually introduce myself to, to folks that don't know me. Other people get to grow up together and, and build on each other and become a part of each other's personalities. And that was not my option. So there's something that, I mean, that has been critical to the development of who I am. And then I went to Michigan for college. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, took the LSAT and everything. And then I worked at, my first job out of college was at a nonprofit called Service Members Legal Defense Network. Our entire mission was to lift the ban on gays in the military, which we eventually did. And I think, you know, what's so interesting about working at a mission-driven organization is that your ultimate goal is to cease to exist. Again, a very strange sort of um, mental state to be in, but but that's, that's kind of where I began. Then I spent 15 years in agencies um, doing marketing, communications, PR, and then four years ago left to start my first company, co-found... Um, that company. And it was a diversity consultancy where I spent two and a half years. And then I turned 40 in March of last year and everything that had, I'd been working on myself for and working towards kind of came to this intersection. And the mantra that came to me that I could not get out of my head or drop was I will no longer abandon myself in service to others. And it just changed the way I lived my entire 2022. And um, it was a lot of endings in addition to beginnings, but coming into my own and myself in a way that I had never been allowed to before. And so I left the company that I founded in March, um, nine days after I turned 40. And, and then Six months ago in July 20th, I started my latest company, Ella, of which I'm the founder and CEO. Turns out if you want to be CEO, you don't have to stay inside of corporate America and wait 40 years. You just start your own company and make yourself the CEO. So, yes, you can. <laughs> so that's what I did. And um, what we're doing is, you know, we've created an inclusive network that acknowledges, you know, women's worth and value and builds generational wealth for them and really provides access to that human and financial capital that has been kept from us for so long. 
And so it's been a wild ride these first six months. And we have had, you know, incredible fairway dinners that we'll talk about a little bit later. And we've met with wonderful women all over the country and world. And also I've just really come into my own in the way that I write and speak out into the world. And LinkedIn has been my primary platform for doing that. And it was always in me. I just didn't have the permission to really say what needed to be said and to set the record straight. And so I finally did that. And that has led to sort of that final question you had of, oh, also I'm married and have kids. <laughs> great. great. <laughs> Brian's great. He's downstairs right now. We've been married for 10 years. Uh, we have a six and a four-year-old, two boys and our dog Lincoln. And that's you know, all of those things are really heavy, important roles in my life that have changed me and have been a part of my evolution and my metamorphosis. But about a week and a half ago um, at the Golden Globes, there was this moment where Michelle Yeoh won Best Actress for the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. And her co-star, Jamie Lee Curtis, had this incredibly visceral, visual reaction to Michelle's winning of just pure unadulterated joy. And what I saw when I saw that I was like, she's just this unabashed hype woman for her friend. And we don't see that very often amongst women. Women, we have been conditioned to see other women as our competition, as threats, as detractors from our own success and our own light. And that is, again, conditioning by a patriarchal society that wants us to be small and to fight one another and be distracted from, from really being successful. And so I wrote this post on LinkedIn about what I want the 2023 mantra to be for women. And it's to be unabashed hype women and to, to decondition, to unlearn, to, to shift this narrative. And I had no idea it was going to sort of take fire the way that it did, but it went viral on LinkedIn. And then one of Jamie Lee Curtis's friends shared the LinkedIn post with her, and then she posted it on her Instagram. And so then it took off in a completely different way. Um, and it's been wild. It's been a wild week and a half um, that I can sort of encapsulate by saying as a former PR marketing person, you know, ending up in 20 major publications that you don't pitch is not common. So, you know, seeing the story and the, the, the word anthem, as Jamie Lee Curtis coined my, my writing, um, in People and the Today Show and Huffington Post and The Guardian and, you know, so many other places was endearing and um, wonderful. But I also felt like so many of them were missing the actual story mm -hmm. because they were focusing on, like, the shirt that I created of the meme and they were missing what was really happening, which is the seismic shift in the way that women are viewing one another. And that mm -hmm. when we do this, when we actually decide we're going to do this, everything is going to change because nothing is going to be able to stop us if we stop fighting each other. So exactly. And I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, the stop fighting each other. I did some work earlier this year or actually early in 22 in a women's group. And part of this group was about having a healthy ecology of the group. And we're not all going to like each other. And please disagree. And please bring in all of you. I think I read in one of your posts at some point <laughs> somewhere about you know being all of us and bringing all of us to the table, even yeah. if there's disagreement, even if I don't like you in this moment. Like it's to have a healthy ecology and healthy community and healthy society. We need all of us to be welcome yeah. and all of us to belong. Like even when you were telling your story about moving every two to four years, yeah. like there's, that also speaks to belonging Absolutely. And what that feels like. And with women, you know, going back to your post and why, I mean, really, why do you, what, what do you really think happened there? Like, yes, it's a post and it went viral and that's great. But what do you think underneath all of that? What's happening? What, mm -hmm. why did that particular thing catch fire? Yeah. So I think that 
I think that something has been happening and brewing in a bigger way for the past four or five years. Um, when you think about the moron who was elected president and what that told us about how women's worth is valued in the world based on what a person at that level can say about us and still be named you know, the most powerful leader in the world, that sends a message. And I think that it was just this wake up call of like, oh my God, we really are so far. We're so far from where we thought we were finally chipping away. And, and I'm saying this as a straight white woman of, of whom I have the most privilege next to a straight white man. And so my experience, although challenging for lots of different reasons, doesn't hold a candle to the experience of women of color and most specifically to black women. And so I think that was happening, Me Too and Time's Up were starting to take hold. And just as women were finally crossing over that 50% threshold of the labor force, the pandemic hit, right? And 2.5 million women pushed out of the labor force not to return. There, I think it broke. I think it broke so many of us. And it did a combination of sort of like breaking us down, but also breaking us open. and it accelerated over those next three years of the pandemic that we've navigated a metamorphosis. And I believe that when women saw, oh my God, I am not guaranteed time. I keep saying, I'm going to do this in five years. I'm going to do this in 10 years. As soon as my kid, you know, reaches this age, as soon as this person um, you know, moves to a different job and I'm not reporting into him or her anymore. It was all of these sort of like qualifiers about when we were going to finally choose ourselves and when we were going to become the priority that were based on extenuating circumstances. We recognized that nothing was guaranteed anymore. And so I believe it accelerated women's decisions about transforming. And so, you know, the definition of metamorphosis is a transformation from one thing into something completely different. And it's, I've, I've been obsessed with butterflies ever since I was a little girl. And to me, like you really think about what that transformation is of being a caterpillar, cocooning, like going into yourself, healing, like figuring it out and then coming out as something totally different, expanding and taking flight. And and so that I believe has been happening. It's really been happening. And the other really cool idea that's called the butterfly effect is about what happens when multiple butterflies come together and are flapping their wings, that they actually create and change weather pattern on the opposite side of the world. What in the hell, right? So, so great. So cool. So, right. So there is, when you think about that visual and you think about all of us inching along as these caterpillars, like one day we'll do it. It's out there. My, my chance is coming. And then we, we go into ourselves, we cocoon during the pandemic and we're trapped with our thoughts and our, our own like mortality and like virality. Right. And so we come out of those. I think we have broken out of those cocoons and women are are now flying and we are recognizing our collective power if we come together. So that is why I think the post hit because it was it was pointing to an inherent truth that we know that we do see women as competition. Even the best of us and those that love women and that have sisterhoods that are that are strong, we see another woman who who has a success and we think immediately, is she really that good? Does does she really deserve that? And the point is not to shame ourselves when that happens. It's to acknowledge that that's conditioning. It's not what we really believe. It's what we've been taught to believe since we were two years old watching freaking Disney. I was just on the phone with Christina Stemble, the founder of Farm Girl Flowers, and we were talking about this, right? And she was like, of course we think this. We have been watching this since we were kids, that, that women are each other's competition and that the end goal is a man, right? And so- in power and, and that there's a finite amount of it. And so I just feel that like, by calling this out and saying, your, another woman's success can actually feel good to you too. It doesn't have to feel like you're less than, or it's a slight on your ability. 
there is, there was a freedom and a release and a permission that came along with that, that I have seen, I mean, women have just lost their minds with this, right? It's, it's gone everywhere. And, and what they are doing now is they're hyping each other. They are sharing each other's successes and they're sharing the gratitude that they have um, for women that have been with them through their entire journey. Mm -hmm. So, so, so beautifully said. And even for myself right now, like this whole thing in the hype women and you calling it a movement, not only is it a moment, it's a movement. Totally feel that with so deeply. And it's inspired me to think about, okay, what am I going to do about this? How am I going to hype my women? I've started making a list because I've seen a lot of posts where people are tagging you and then like making a list of the women and that, you know, and I'm like, I'm going to like, I'm going to take 30 days and I'm going to make a list of 30 women. And every single day I'm going to get, you know, my husband and I had a conversation about it this morning Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just inspiring me just in my own corner of the world over here to do what I can do. That's right. That feels good for me. Right. And so also because this podcast, my audience speaking towards a section of the population that is over 40, Mm -hmm. 40s, 50s, kind of that middle time of life. And it is such a transitional and Mm -hmm. transformational time. Like when you were saying earlier about, um, uh, giving yourself, you didn't feel like you had the permission mm-hmm. and you had abandoned yourself and, yeah. uh, you know, all these things start to come up and we start to look around at this time and go, what have I been doing? What, have, what, what, what's happening? Who am I? Do I even know? What do I believe that I never signed up for? I didn't, holy shit. I didn't, I don't, what? Like, I, I didn't, do I so, even want any of this? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I never signed up for any of this. So anyway, it is, it's that piece of like slowing down and going into the cocoon. And sometimes it can be really scary because stuff starts happening. It's like another birthing process, this metamorphosis. So this time of life is like transition central, transformation, metamorphosis, all these big, big feelings and big words. Mm -hmm. And we oftentimes don't have we don't have um, powerful demonstrations. Mm-hmm. of what that looks like in a, mm-hmm. in an ecologically healthy way, where That's we're it. really standing with each other and for each other and stepping into the rebel and saying no, when that's appropriate, and then turning and stepping into the radical and mm-hmm. saying, this is what I'm for. That's exactly right. And, and, and being able to dance in between those two places. And for me and for my my stage, I'm 53. So like for me and my stage and, and the women that I'm speaking to and really everyone on the planet, but it's like, look, this is not the time to go to sleep. This is yeah. the time to wake up. That's right. We have wisdom. We have resiliency. We've been places and done things. We have, we have gifts. We have talents. Like this is the time to step in, not step out. That's exactly right. And I think that a lot of what's going to happen and it is happening is this is not going to come naturally to everyone. And it's Mm -hmm. also, it's going to be work to do the work of the deconditioning and the unlearning. And so, sorry, if you can hear the the boys downstairs, um, no worries. Um, so they, you know, there is going to be resistance and there is, there is still going to be that that message that says one at a time, the light is only for one of us. And that that's already come through even in all of this, right? It's like, wait a minute, why Jamie and not Michelle? And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's both. Okay. Uh This isn't, the world tells us that it can only be about Michelle winning or Jamie hyping her. And it's both. And women want both and we deserve both. And we don't want to have to continue to be pitted against one another and choose whose light is more worthy. Both are worthy. And so that narrative has come up in all of this from women. And I, I understand it, right? I, I get where it's coming from, but I will not subscribe to it. And I won't slow down or silence what we are doing 
because of that narrative attempting to reinsert itself into this. So it's going to take work, right? It's 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 not going to be easy. And then I think the other thing that's beautiful that you're talking about is again at these different stages of our lives where we have these different milestones and life events and again looking at ourselves who am I now? Is this does this even still work? Is the thing that I wanted 20 years ago the thing I want today? Probably not, right? Like I find that you know I said I've said to my husband, like, we have to meet each other again every time we go through a major evolution. And so when we when we were married at first, it's like we got to sit across from each other again because we're no longer these single kids. Like, what does this mean? What do you want now? What what's different? What are your expectations that I don't necessarily know about yet? Same happened when we became parents. I had never met him as a dad and I had never been a mother. And so we have to sit across from each other and say, now, what does it look like? What do you need now? I think we miss those conversations a lot with our partners, our spouses, our friends, our business associates, where we have gone through our own evolution and they still remember us as a different version. And in some cases that worked better for some people. And that was so much of what I experienced this past year is like when I evolved out of the service role that I had always been in, there were a lot of people that were not happy about that because they benefited from me being in service to them. And those are the people that you grow out of and you grow free from. And it's important to, to know that not all of these relationships are forever. Um, the one with yourself is the only one that is. And so if you can't look yourself in the mirror and really show that care and love and value, then every other relationship is gonna suffer because of it. And the last thing I'll say is like the, the other thing I've been deeply committed to addressing and acknowledging, and I've, you know, I've done it with kind of what we've created with the fairway, but also with what's happening with this hype women movement is to also stop the intergenerational fighting of women where we have such pain that's underneath what's actually happening based on how we were treated or something that something that happened to us either in the workplace or otherwise. And there is this weird sense that the next generation should have to go through it too, right? If I did it, you should have to do it. And that isn't going to heal anyone, right? More pain isn't going to heal the pain that's already happened. And so that that is this whole hype women sort of mentality that says no one can help when they're born. Okay, so someone who's 70 or 55 or 40 or 25, they can't help where they were born in the world at this moment in time. And so we are not going to make each other feel bad for that. We are going to acknowledge the val the inherent value at each of these stages that we bring. And when we come together collectively, we are unstoppable. So good. And I, I, I love the intergenerational piece because, I mean, I see it in my own family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear it in my own family dynamic. I have a son who's 23. I have a daughter who's 20. She's in college yeah. and is on fire and is so like grabbing the world. And I love to see her passion and, and it can, it can rub, it can rub, of course. right? We've had of course. some really interesting conversations and, and I think, and then I hear other, you know, we hear all the things about millennials and none and all this kind of stuff. And I'm Sometimes I sit back and I go, well, who are their parents? <laughs> I wonder how they got, I mean, you know, like, you know, just hold right. on a second. Like right. what world did they come, what world are we giving them? Yeah. What have we created that they are stepping into? That's right. Do we know what it feels like to be them? Do we know what it feels like to be 20 right now, to be a 20 year old woman right now? <sighs> I mean, I can't even imagine with the different yeah. pressures and the different oh everything. And, you know, and especially if you're a young woman of color. Oh my God. Or a trans person, or it, right. I mean, like, I can't even imagine. So right. we had an interesting conversation. My husband and I, at one point, um, I said, Do you have you ever walked through a parking lot ever in your whole life, especially when it's dark and looked over your shoulder? Ever. Do you know what that feels like? And he's, and he, he really sat and thought, and he said, no, I don't. He goes, you actually, I said, every single time I have ever been in a parking lot or walked down a street in broad daylight by yeah. myself. Absolutely. And and I'm a straight white woman. Like yeah. 
That's right. So it is, it's, there's just, yeah, there's so much there. There's so the way, much. There. The way that women walk through the world is heavier. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had that same conversation with my husband. I, I said to him a few years ago, and this was before the pandemic. Um, so we were out in the world, you know, going into offices, traveling for work, all of those things more, more often. And we're kind of coming back into that now a little bit, but mm-hmm. I said, how many times today did you worry about your safety? And he asked me to repeat the question because he didn't understand it. Mm-hmm. Cause he was like, I, what do you mean? I don't, I don't worry about my safety. And I said, okay, well, for me, it was 47 today. And I went through, I'm like, especially if you're traveling for work, right? It's like, I'm in the Uber and the, the driver's looking me at, at me too many times in the mirror. It's making me uncomfortable. Um, they're taking a weird exit. Like, where are we going now? Right. I'm, I'm now, um, I'm going to my hotel and there's a guy on, he gets off on the elevator after me. Like, is he going to follow me to my room? Like all of these things, right? All of these moments, like you said, you go into a parking lot. So when you think about the emotional and the mental labor, the unseen work that we are doing in addition to just functioning and what that does to our, our spirit and our mental health. It is, it is a grind. And then to be a, like the most historically excluded group, right? A, a black trans woman. Can you imagine the way you walk through the world invites so much discrimination and bias and people, there are a lot of wonderful people, but there are a lot of horrible people in the world. And they feel that they have a right to comment on who you are. And then, and your safety is, is in question often. And so that is something we need to address. And it happens online too, right? This isn't just about what happens when we walk outside. Like, you know, I wrote on LinkedIn, I think last night, because I was just so frustrated and pissed off that like, how many times do men truly believe that we are here to entertain them, that we are here for their entertainment, that we are here to, to serve them. And the number of, of inappropriate DMs that I get And you're just like, in what universe, (laughs) right? In what universe do you think that this would go anywhere? And, and I'm not saying like, I'm special. I think that that person probably sent it to 500 women. Um, but, but it's work for us, right? It's work that we have to do to navigate. I, you, you walk down the street and a man looks at you and you think to yourself, if I smile, does that make him think I'm interested? If I don't smile, does that piss him off? I can't win right? I can't win. I'll be riding on the Peloton. And every time a woman high fives me on the Peloton, I'm like, fine, I'll high five you. If a guy does it, I'm like, no, because he's going to think I want to sleep with him. Right? (laughs) If I high five him back for him, that's an invitation that we now have something potentially going on here. Right. He's like, she wants me. Right. And (laughs) so it's like, it's like none of this, none of this is like simple or taken lightly. Any, every single one of these interactions, we have to be so hyper vigilant in how we navigate them and, and how like broad, like you said, broad day, like walking down the street, two guys split on the sidewalk and I had to walk between them. And so my options are I cross the street and piss them off. Right. Or I walk between them and potentially set myself up to walk into a dangerous situation. And so we're just navigating this stuff all the time. And it is so much damn work. And if we weren't focused on that, what we could do with that time and energy, we would be ruling the world, but we, we don't, we don't hold men accountable for the way that they, they view and treat women. And it, I mean, it's, it's from the very, very top of our country, you know, all the way down that has been the experience. I think women are just, we are beyond fed up. We are just beyond fed up at this point. Yeah. 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 What, uh, what's been one of the biggest, um, transitions or something that you have personally gone through that you looked back on the other side of it. And you went, damn, I did that. Ooh. Um, I mean, definitely becoming a mother. Mm. That was the most insane thing I've ever done in my life. Um, (laughs) most insane, like not for the faint of heart. (laughs) Um, I was not one of those women who had this like beautiful glowing pregnancy and like, you know, was, had shinier hair and all of those things. Like it was tough. It was, it was a tough pregnancy. And, um, and I had a really hard postpartum with both of my kids. 
um, undiagnosed postpartum depression and anxiety the first time and late diagnosed the second time, like past, past the point of almost no return, I think. Um, and so the, the message again, that, that we have to be so significantly our own advocates, um, and, and fight to just be seen, acknowledged, um, validated, that was very visceral during pregnancy and postpartum and, and then just being a mother in general, being a mother, going back into you know the office three months later. And that I was one of the lucky ones to have three months, horrible experience, breastfeeding and pumping, all of those things. And just like, um, so it, it's this dichotomy of like the, the most powerful experience I've ever had. And yet the most self-destructive, like, I've never felt lonelier than after having a baby. Um, it's a very isolating, it can be a very isolating experience. So I think back and I look back on that younger version of myself and I have so much empathy for her and, um, I'm doing work to protect her now and to give her things that I didn't know how to give her at that time. So, so much of my healing has been healing younger versions of myself that asked to be seen, asked to be validated and weren't, were dismissed, were, were um, again, like used because of my people pleasing um, personality and my, the fact that I tied my worth to my service to people and my performance that worked for a lot of people. And when you stop doing that, they get very upset and you are called selfish by a lot of people. And you just have to recognize that self-worth and self-love, that is the opposite of selfishness. Um, and when you know that definition, it doesn't actually matter what people call you. Hmm. When standing now and healing your, the younger versions of yourself. And then the, the piece of, okay, I'm not going to be in service anymore. And having those people like, we're like, like what you said, it doesn't work for everyone. Yeah. I, I mean, I just feel those two things being so completely tied. I would love it if you can, if you, if you're willing to share an example of like, what does that healing process look like for you? Like going back to your young ones, the younger versions and saying what, or, or what that process is like. And then the releasing of, we're not going to do that anymore. The releasing of that and, and what that was like. And if you can give an example. Yeah. I mean, 20 years of therapy. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like turning 40, it wasn't like, oh, and then a light clicked. And I was like, oh, never mind. I've I'm a different person. It was 20 years of therapy and work and working on myself and, and working through things that mm -hmm. gave me the opportunity in that moment to make a different decision. And so that, that I think has been the most important part of the healing process, but there is something really wild about parenting and then reparenting yourself simultaneously that has snuck up on me in ways that I did not expect. And I will give you an example of something that happened two weeks ago that has changed the way I will parent my boys for the rest of my life. Um, will is six, Charlie is four. They were home, it was still the holiday break and we were like on day 14. And so everyone was ready to just lose it on each other. Just like we, it was cold out. Like we were going outside, everyone was a little stir crazy and we had, you know, we got these blocks for Charlie for Christmas. And so he was playing with them and then Will was playing with them and Will's three years old, two and a half years older. So he's faster. He's a little more advanced at what he can do. And so he built this like really phenomenal tower that was like, you know, ombre color coded. And he used about three, three quarters of the blocks. Okay. So here's little Charlie with like a quarter of the blocks, putting some random thing together, comparing himself to Will's, Will's, masterpiece feeling less than, but
but also feeling like he doesn't have a lot to work with because he was like, I need some more blocks and Will has used most of them. So I had this moment, Angie, where I'm like, okay, I'm going to let them try to work it out. But if it comes to a point where I need to intervene, I am going to disappoint someone because I'm either going to say to Charlie, Charlie, just work with what you have. Like you're doing great. Like we'll build that. And like, you know, you need to keep it intact right now. And then Charlie's going to be upset. Or I'm going to say to Will, well, this is really beautiful. Why don't we go do something else and let Charlie use this and, you know, take it apart because that's what Legos are meant for. And then Will's going to be upset. Well, I picked the wrong person. <laughs> and I should know this because my firstborn is an Aries like me. And so <laughs> we are not relaxed people. <laughs> and so I said, Charlie, you can start taking that apart. Like, well, we're going to do something else. And Will lost his mind. And I'm talking a full hour, not, not like in temper tantrum, the full hour, but in and out of a temper tantrum for a full hour, hysterical, angry, sheepish, um, aggressive, right. He was going through all of the emotions and I was doing all the things that I've read about and Mm -hmm. tried to do where I'm like, let him leave the room to go sort of like self-regulate. And then I go and I find him and I say like, Hey, just checking on you, but I'll, I'll give you time. Let him know I'm still there, but not like overstepping, trying to like, trying to rationalize, then getting really frustrated because he's not right. It's like, we were going through it all together. And meanwhile, Charlie's like building the blocks, like, Oh shit, this is (laughs) like, this is a really bad situation. So we end up an hour later up in Will's room and Will's sitting on the floor. And here's something that I do 50 times a day with my kids. I apologize. I'm like, mess that up. I I messed that up. Right. And I never rationalize it. I don't say, I'm sorry. I yelled, but you, you did this. And that's why. Right. I just say, I'm sorry. I yelled. I shouldn't have yelled. Leave it at that. So I apologize 50 times a day. I screwed that up. That wasn't, that wasn't good because I need them to know that I'm not perfect. And I also need them to know that, that I will make mistakes and they don't deserve it. And so I sat down with him and I was like, I'm really sorry. I made the wrong choice. And then I had this moment where I was like, I'm going to see if he can help me figure out how to do this better next time. So I said to him, listen, for me, I had a really tough choice to make because you both wanted something that required the other to give something up. And I needed to make a decision about who I was going to, you know, choose and I knew that one of you is going to be disappointed and will looks me dead in the eye and goes, then why did you pick me? And I was like, fuck, because my answer was because you're older, because you're more mature, because you can handle, and guess, guess what I am. I'm the firstborn girl. And that was what I was told my entire life. And so I have had it harder. I have had more put on my plate. I have been expected to take it on. I have been told you only, the world only gives you what you can handle, right? Resilience, resilience sold to us as a badge of honor when really it is a, it is a battle scar. And I was like, I shouldn't have, I should not have chosen you because I wasn't going to give the excuse that I had been told, which was you're older you can handle it because it's not his fault that he was born first. And so what am I going to do? I'm always going to not pick him. And he's always going to be the disappointed one. He's always going to be the one that has to handle it. I made the change the way I parented that, that moment that day. And it's going to make Charlie a better kid too, because he's not going to just have everything solved and sorted. And of course we will age appropriately navigate it, but that was that reparenting moment, that healing of the younger version of myself. It was like, it just came flooding back. Like, like just like a freight train of like, oh my God, this is literally my entire life. Mm. And I have this conversation with so many of my friends that are the firstborn, especially the firstborn girl and what that has meant. And And what, what that, how that has been in so many ways, a, an asset out in the world, but man, it's just because we're carrying it doesn't mean it's not heavy. It's really heavy. So. Exactly. That is such a gorgeous story. Thank you for sharing that. And it is fascinating to see the reflection 
in our children and what that does and the reverberations that come back and the, the insights and awarenesses that we can, that we can then take hold in our own healing, in our own relationship and with ourselves, with our own family. My, um, I was an only child growing up and my mother suffered from depression and was bipolar. I didn't know this yeah, until yeah. much, much, much later. That's she committed sad. suicide in 2006. Mm-hmm. So like there's been, but that reparenting of yourself mm-hmm. with your own children, like it, I mean, every day, just about still, you know, and my kids are getting older now, but, but absolutely um, can feel and see and hear hear Mm -hmm. how that evolves and the messages that we are told over and over and over and not even by our own family, but by society at large, like you're the older one. Well, you're the one that has to carry everything. That's right. You know, I've had that conversation with my own son in a couple of different ways. Like he'll, you know, I'm like, you're older. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Absolutely. I I probably did put more on you. Of course. So many different ways. And I was so unaware and and unconscious about it. And I apologize. Like, however that shows up for you now, we can talk about it. Like I'm open. Tell me anything that you need to say to me, say it to me. Well, Angie, that is huge. Okay. For you to be able to say that though, that is going to be, that's healing for him. Mm -hmm. Um, whether or not he needs it at this moment, or he's going to need it in five years, or he's going to need it. If he decides he wants to become a parent, the fact that you validated that that was the experience and that you are here to help heal it. Like, listen, we're all human. Like this, Mm -hmm. no one's going to nail this and like get through it without mistakes. I think the most, like the thing that is most triggering for me in my life is being invalidated. Mm. Um, because I was invalidated a lot. Um, Like, I'm not, I don't think that's what they meant, right? I think you're overreacting that, you know, you always, you always do that, right? And so like, my experience was always like up for discussion or debate Mm. versus being my experience. And so what that does to you is you start to lose trust in yourself because you're like, did it happen the way that I thought it happened? Mm. Or, or is that version that I just heard the real version? You lose your intuition. That is what has happened to me in the past. Like when I turned 40, the, my gut, my intuition, so many things that I had had feelings about that I stuffed down, I just decided to go right back to where they were. And that is, that is what changed so much of my, what I was doing in the world and and where I decided to go forward from there. I think that like, I say to women all the time, what does your gut tell you? That is the right answer. I was like, I don't even know what it is. And I might, I might not even agree with, with the decision. It might be a different decision than I would make, but I am not you. Right. There is not one answer to this. And your intuition and your gut is one of your strongest senses. And it is why I, is why anger is such an important emotion that I think women, especially black women, right? We're women are told so often, why are you so angry? And when you think about what's happening in the world and all the things that we should be angry about, (laughs) it is absurd that that question's even asked, right? But, (laughs) but again, like anger, anger is an emotion that tells us when something is wrong. And in the best of cases, it drives us to take action. And so anger is incredibly important. And, and so I have been told my whole life, when I'm angry about what's happening in the world, I don't, why why do we do it this way? That's not fair, blah, blah, blah. God, why are you so angry? Well, because I'm paying attention and I, and I don't like this and I don't think it's okay. And I don't, I don't want to keep being a part of it. And when you're that person, it's, it can be hard if you don't have people that are, are willing to sort of take the risk to go against the grain, but it's the, I mean, a woman's intuition is just, it's a fucking superpower. It is everything. And I find in my circles, in my, in my communities, in client work that, and what I hear so often is, well, I don't, I don't know if I have not, I don't, not, I don't know if I have it, but I don't know how to feel it. I don't know how to hear it. I don't know. I don't know where it went or I, or, or we don't trust it. Like, well, is that my, and then we can go, you know, then we can go on the whole 
self-help world and be like, well, is that my ego talking or is that my intuition? <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah, you go down the ultra spiritual oh, yeah. world and that, you know, and it's like, and all, everything's great, but you know, there's a place for, for, you know, all the different modalities, but, but so much like in our body, for me, like our bodies are so important. A woman's body is her messaging system. Have and to this book, the body keeps the score. Of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, what is this? A woman's Bible? I know. I'm not, it's like, I'm not religious, but this is my Bible. Yeah, true. I, I so get that. And it, yeah, but it's like, this is my prayer. This is what I trust. This is what I'm going to listen to. Nothing outside of me. And so, and it might make people uncomfortable and people might not agree. And I might disappoint people. And as a woman raised in a conservative, traditional Southern state, my whole life was built on looking good, avoiding looking bad, pleasing people and like being seen and not heard. Being a, being a good girl, so, listening, I mean, respecting, respecting your elders, oh. not questioning. Like, again, it was like you were taught that your worth came from your performance. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. This is amazing. I mean, I, we could obviously go on forever. Oh, I do want to talk about Ella. Yes. So tell me about this new venture. And I think I did read again somewhere that your husband had said to you five words at one point, like don't start another business or something, yep. something around that. And then you immediately went and started another business. So yep. tell us about Ella. <laughs> he's still thrilled. He's really <laughs> thrilled about it. Yes. He said, please don't start another company. And uh, it was more about like, it's just hard, right? It's, it's a hard thing to do. It is. And, it is. And he saw how hard it was for me to do the very first time. But, um, I think what's tough is like when you feel you are called to do something and you're just, you want to do something that is very different. It's hard to find it already in existence. That's, that's, I think what's been tough for me. Um, you know, he would say like, can't you just get a comms job? Just go get a comms <laughs> job. Right. And I'm like, I could, right. I could, I just think I would be miserable because I, I, I feel that I am here to, to, to drive this conversation and to try to push this movement forward so that we see progress faster. That is, that is just what I feel I am a very small part of, but that is where I should be putting my energy. If I don't put my energy there, I don't feel like I will be really truly living what I'm supposed to be doing. So with Ella, I wanted to get back to women. Um, mm -hmm. I just, um, I wanted to focus on women. I wanted, you know, and I say this a lot because the question has been asked in the past, like, oh, like women, isn't that a niche market? You know? And it's like, yeah, we're, it's not, it's, we're 51% of the population. We're half of the labor force. We're 85% of consumer buying power. We are the damn market. Yeah. If women are not at the center of the pr products and services that you are creating, if they aren't behind the scenes creating and making those and, and being a part of the consideration set for how you are creating them, you are missing the market. And so, and, and you even think about men's products, guess who buys them? The majority yeah. of men's products are purchased by women. So, right. Exactly. Right. It's just like, it's like, they don't know where to get their damn pants. Um, so, <laughs> so, so like all of this, right. It's like, yep. we have, we have all of this power. It's just not recognized in the same way. Um, and it's because we do incredible amounts of unpaid, undervalued, mm. um, and unseen labor. And so with Ella, what I wanted to do is entire premise, make women more money. That's it. Because to me, when women have more money, everybody wins. Women do a better job of investing. They do a better job of managing their money. They invest back into their communities and their families and the health and well-being of everyone around them. And so money in their hands is the smarter decision. And when women have more money, they have more power and influence. And that is what we need in order to swing the pendulum towards, towards us. And we have, we've never had it. We've never seen it. And so I want to sort of really just overcorrect mm. uh, to hopefully one day land somewhere in the equitable middle. But, but that, that was the intention. It was to, it was to figure out how to do that. So I had this idea a few years ago. And I would talk about this with our former clients because I was like, you know, it's so interesting to me. Men do business on the golf course. They've been doing it for 300 years. They're just out there, like on their company's dime, on their company's time, building wealth, 
sharing investments, giving each other backdoor opportunities to jobs, and we are not invited. And if we dare to show up, we're not included. And, and this is an entire business ecosystem. And I'm just like, this is bullshit. I don't want to play golf. And I have no problem with the, the game of golf. And I don't have a problem with straight white men. What I have a problem with are systems that are exclusive, that are built by and for one type of person and are, are barriers to everyone else. That is what my issue is with. And so my idea was, let's create our own damn fairway where we do this our way. And we have this, it's the same premise, but we do it in a way that is authentic to us as women. And so our fairway dinners are these groups of 20 women that we bring together that are truly there to do business with each other. And of course we talk about our families and we talk about where did you get that amazing lipstick and like <laughs> what, you know, what's, what are you watching on TV right now? What book did you yeah. read? Like those yeah. conversations naturally happen, but the programming and like the intention and what we have everyone go through is to make their ask while we are together, because this group is, it's a very curated group. Every single person is there because of who they can be to the other women in that room and who mm. those women can be to them. Mm. And so when someone says across the table, I, um, I, I'm just looking for speaking paid opportunities. This is something I'm really focusing on. I feel like I have a lot of worth. And the person across the table goes, oh, hey, I'm, I'm head of comms at Walgreens and we're actually looking to bring in a couple of speakers. Cool, great, you're hiring her. Next person, we just do it. And what we don't do is like, well, I don't know, because like, I don't want to look like I'm giving you, no, no, no. That's not what guys do. They mm. just, they don't overthink it. They're like, we've made this connection. You're vetted. I trust you go. And so what I want to do is I just want, I want the money to stay with women and I want it to be built with women. And, and that is the premise of what we are attempting to do here. And the conversations that we're trying to have, where we're deconditioning from those conversations, from, from what we've been told about talking about money, talking about what we're worth. I share what I charge with these women. I share what I was able to get for something because that sharing of knowledge is going to be the, the change in whether or not we are able to actually exponentially succeed or incrementally advance. Mm. So that is, again, what we have not been taught to do and we've been told it is inappropriate and I just won't be a part of that anymore. So that's what we're doing at Ella and with this hype women movement that's, you know, that's really surrounding and, and building upon that work already that we, we will keep pushing and writing that. And we have lots of really exciting um, things coming up in the next few weeks about some cool partnerships we're doing with women-owned businesses and amplifying them and, and leading towards, you know, just a really incredible one-year anniversary um, on July 20th, where we're going to bring you better be there, girl. All of these women oh, together, coming. right? In Chicago, <laughs> we're going to come together and we're going to just continue to hype each other and build that generational wealth that um, we have been, that we've missed out on. Yeah. I mean, everything you said, I'm just like, yep, check. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. When's the next dinner? I'm coming. I don't yeah, care where it is. Dinner, too, like, right? just tell me where I, I'm Done. buying a ticket, like whatever, Done. whatever needs to Done. happen. It's um, yeah, so definitely. And I've been looking at the app and I've looked at the fairway and I've been all through the website. It's amazing. Everyone needs to go check it out. And I so believe in the message of creating wealth and generational wealth and having the women at the forefront of that. Because even in my own history, my own personal story, my familial history, I mean, I can see the impact mm. of a woman not being in that position and what it can do. Absolutely. So it is such a fire for me. And I'm so happy that you are doing this um, and that you are the one leading it. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, I, that's so lovely for you to say. And, and that's been, that's been a, a shift for me as well, because my entire career has been in support roles, right? I was always marketing comms. I was behind the scenes. And so to come into the forefront was was a shift. It was a transition. And it was also a, I had to have a conversation with myself about, am I worth it? Am mm -hmm. I the one? It, am I enough? And God, we are like, we just are. 
And we have got to stop wasting our time over evaluating ourselves, our abilities and, and our worthiness, because it's, it's just keeping us from, from coming into our full power. And so what I would say to anyone listening is if your intuition is telling you to go towards something and to do it, listen, listen and trust her. And, and some of that is going to be the healing process is learning to listen and trust yourself again. When you've been told so often that deep down, whoever she is, isn't worthy and isn't right. And isn't validated. You have to parent that version of yourself and, and heal her and, and show her that it, you, that you are worth it. And you were always worth it. Even if it didn't feel like you were, that is, that's the evolution and the transformation, the metamorphosis that I feel so many of us are going through at, at very different stages of our lives. And I'm just incredibly happy that it feels like it's happening collectively across the world right now. And that is the seismic shift that is going to tilt the world on its axis. Beautiful. So good. And I just have to point out, I wore my butterfly necklace pendant <laughs> in honor of our conversation. Oh, I love and it. on the other side, it says free. <laughs> Oh, yes. Okay. I'm going to need a link so, to that. Yep. I, I, I got you. I'm giving you that link. Um, thank you. Wow. Really. Thank you for this conversation, for what you're doing, for how you're showing up in the world. I'm going to give all the links to Instagram, LinkedIn, website, all of that in the show notes. Um, and please, 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 everyone go check Erin out. She is a force of nature. And I am so grateful to have whatever happened in the universe that had you come up in a feed somewhere. And I'm like that one. Oh my God. She's amazing. Universe so, has plans. And if, you know, if you're willing to listen to what it's trying to tell you, it can be really powerful. So mm -hmm. thank you. I'm so grateful that our paths crossed, that we've had this conversation and that I know we will do important things together in this world. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you again. I don't know about you, but I was so energized after that conversation. Erin is a force of nature, and I'm really grateful I took action on the impulse that drove me to ask her one simple question. Women, ask the question. Ask for what you want. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. And please subscribe to the podcast and leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your shows. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you also want to see these conversations. Share with your friends and follow me, Angie.Bird, on Instagram. All of this will help the show gain momentum and help other sisters out there find us who are looking to bring some magic and mayhem into their lives as well.